Hi, this is Donna McKechnie, and I'm eager to uh, release this new information about Birdland, a new show, Donna McKechnie, in good company with some wonderful people each time. And uh, Jerry Mitchell is my first guest. And so I'm eagerly waiting to talk to Rabbi Saul Solomon at Days Gone By at UNC Radio. Oh, shalom, everybody. Welcome on this fine and beautiful morning. So excited once more to be on the Dave's Gone By radio program to talk to a theatrical legend. I am a legend in my own mind, but this woman is an actual, real theater legend. She won a Tony Award, a Drama Desk Award, and a Theater World Award, the trifecta, as it were, for Best Actress in a Musical for a Little Show that uh, they called a chorus line. She was, yes, the original Cassie, the music in the mirror. It was her, the dancer, Donna McKechnie, but she's done so many other things as well. Other Broadway shows, she's been on TV in Dark Shadows, and now she's doing cabaret, and you get to see her in a wonderful venue like Birdland. In fact, she's playing there this Monday night. You must go see her, but now we must hear her. Donna McKechnie, welcome to the neighborhood. Well, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. Oh, thank we you. We love you because you're such a good audience. We love people who support the theater. So I really uh, I appreciate this. It's because it's a new and exciting uh, venue for me. It's a new format because it is a cabaret show, but it's a tribute to my passion, which is musical theater. And I've invited a great, uh, well, he's like the man of the year right now, Mr. Broadway, Jerry Mitchell, choreographing here and in London. He has new, two new productions. So I thought it would be wonderful for people to have a kind of an up-close and personal conversation and tell some stories. And uh, we come from the same background in terms of, of growing up dancing. And uh, I want to ask him some really questions that I'm curious about. And also, there's a couple of wonderful uh, performers that are going to be with us to sing songs from all of his great hits, you know, like Kinky Boots and uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which is a great show. Oh, I basically. love that show. Very funny, uh, very funny musical on Broadway. But have you, you ever worked with Jerry Mitchell? Yes, we did Follies. Um, oh. he, he was choreographing a production, a great production, that actually Stephen Sondheim and James Golden were, were working with us as well in rehearsal, and Jerry choreographed a beautiful production of Follies at the Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn, New Jersey, well, quite a few years ago, but uh, that's when I fell in love with him, I think, because he did such a great job, and he um, paid a little homage to Michael Bennett and kept some of Michael's original choreography in uh, the big tap number, and uh, I, I just, I love that. That was a, a great... He's a great person, too, and so I, I'm really looking forward to seeing him Monday and um, well, having some fun. If you were to differentiate the different styles, how would, how would you describe Jerry Mitchell's kind of dance or his choreography versus Michael Bennett or Bob Fosse? What makes Mitchell's style? Well, he's, uh, he's kind of got it all covered. I mean, he's a hoofer. He's a fight trainer. He's... I mean, this is one of the things I want to sit down and talk with him, with everyone, because I want to find out what, you know, he's, his, the trajectory of his career from dancer to well-rounded performer to assistant in choreographing, you know, with Jerome Robbins and Michael Bennett and then with Jack O'Brien and then directing and now he's producing. I'm very curious to find out myself. His background is very strong in dance. And, and it covers all forms. You know, I think that's uh, incredible. So to compare them, I don't know. That's hard. I think he has a great reference, and uh, and he's a showman. You know, maybe that's it. It's, he's kind of a the choice. His material varies to a degree, but it. I think it's so difficult to have this world of commerce, Broadway, and then to still keep your artistic expression. And that's a very hard thing to do. And I think he's able to, I think he's done that. And, he, and that's one of my questions. I want to ask him how he does that <laughs> because he's very, he wants to serve it up, you know, serve it on a silver platter for people. But at the same time, he wants to say something important. And um, 
and break down some boundaries for people to open open up the world a little more. There's always a message. So I, I want to find out what makes him tick. What makes Jerry Mitchell tick? And everybody can find that out, hopefully, on Monday night at Birdland in Donna McKechnie's show, In Good Company. But we're trying to find out what makes you tick and what made you tap and dance from the very beginning. For example, I was uh, talking very recently with the wonderful Carol Lawrence from the original oh, yes. West Side Story. I, she was one of the people uh, that, when I first came to New York, Everybody who was in West Side Story, they were like gods to us. And she was, I was very inspired by what she did because she was a singer, dancer, actress. Before that was even, you know, uh, called a triple threat. You know, she did everything. And I wanted to emulate that so much. And all those years later, we're working together, you know, in a play. And I'm, uh, I have great admiration for her and that she's, she's, out there still inspiring me, you know? And what she had said uh, was that when she was a little kid, like three, four, five years old, she loved to dance. She was tapping all over the apartment, tappy, 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 ruining the floor. And her mother finally said, you know what, I'm going to move the stove away from the wall. And you can go dance behind where the stove is so nobody sees what you're doing to the linoleum. Would you have similar stories? <laughs> true, true thing she, that she's telling. So do you have similar stories of discovering that you had to dance at a very young age? One of those stories ended up uh, as a story in a chorus line, but through another character. Um, I remember when I was little, I used to hear music and immediately get up and start dancing with my arms up in the air. And my mother would stick her head around the corner and see me. And, and she thought I was trying to be a ballerina. But because it was the Second World War and my father was away, I had this image of dancing with daddy, although I made him an Indian chief for some reason. And uh, I was three years old, and my mother sent me to ballet class later, not, not when I was three, but I always danced like that. And that story ended up in the script for A Chorus Line, as we revealed, as you know, to Michael Bennett, what made us um, start dancing. In fact, that's one of the questions I have for Jerry Mitchell. Well, in uh, an interview that I saw with you, one of the things is, yes, a chorus line was autobiographical about all these groups of dancers and, and performers, but at the same time, it wasn't directly autobiographical, and you had to go through exactly. a bunch of years. It, it was a, there was a, the emotional truth was there, but it was, um, a lot of my stories ended up in bits and snippets, you know, with other characters, um, but Cassie was really the most fictionalized um, character, perhaps, because it it was, um, you know, Michael was trying to get a kind of a secondary storyline, and it was a really hard, hard nut to crack, that one. But, um, so I, I affectionately would stay on stage when, <clears throat> while I was listening to other characters and, and hear bits of my life, my childhood, and I was always, that was a very nice feeling. Did you, in the process of rehearsing and auditioning and doing all of the, the groundwork of a chorus line, was there a moment when you felt it was actually coming together into a, a show and not just this ongoing process towards a show? Yeah, the, the, when it happened for me was when I heard Marvin Hablish play the first song that we heard as a company called At the Ballet. And when I heard that, I went, because the show wasn't really good up to that point. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, it was very hard because it was too long and it was too redundant. And and when Marvin sat down with Ed Cleavan and, and played this song, I went, oh, my gosh, he is now taking us into a whole different hemisphere. This is now artful. This is now art. Wow. Wow. And how long between that moment and the opening off-Broadway at the Joseph Papp uh, Public Theater was it? What was... A few, maybe a few months. So it ramped up pretty quickly once everybody realized, aha, there's a score. There's this was, a, yes, the second, we did two workshops, and, and the music, Marvin and Ed came in into the, the second workshop, and that's when it all fell into place, because all the groundwork was done, so all those, you know, boring days and difficult days and frustrating days all came to, you know, something
something really good. Well, let, let me ask, um, what was a day like in those more early times? Did you all just sit around and tell these awful stories from your childhoods and from your early yeah, nascent and careers? We did, and we did a lot of that, but, but the thing is that was kind of, I laugh at it now, because because we some of us knew that these stories were going to become part of the, you know, creating parts, everybody started competing. I don't think it was conscious, but I think unconsciously people started competing with each other as to who had the worst childhood. <laughs> it got really depressing fast. But um, there was a lot of dancing. There was a lot of improv. It was vi Michael was our captain, our, our leader, the visionary, and um, he just was learning, too, about how to do this. He wanted... He had some very powerful feelings that he wanted to put out there, but he, but he didn't want to be, uh, he wanted to be entertaining, too. So that was a very, very uh, interesting process, and I'm very grateful that I went through that because you learn that not to give up on yourself. You know, even when things don't, aren't working out the way you want them to, um, you have to keep at it. Don't give up, and uh, and it, it will. You know, things can work out if you stay with your commitment. Wow. And may I ask, at what point in the process, or even perhaps when it was running, did you and Michael Bennett become more than just associates? When did you? Was were you a couple before the show even opened, or did it take a, after well, no, that? No, no, no. We were friends for years. We were friends. We danced together on Hullabaloo on television, and. Um, it happened, I guess, uh, after the show opened. I mean, it was uh, it, it felt the romantic aspect of our relationship kind of developed from once the show ha had this um, this glow, you know. And I guess we did too. So, you know. And as as I've heard in other interviews, and, and you also wrote the book, that it was a difficult marriage because you're both people in show business and different yeah. expectations and things. How long were you actually married? Well, it was very, very short-lived, but in some ways that was good, you know, because um, I, I, adult, I didn't miss the marriage, as I missed the friendship, you know, and that, that was, um, so it was very short, I think, a year. But you were able amicably to go on past that as friends for years after that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It took a while, but I was able to, um, you know, come back when she asked me to do this big gala uh, at the Schubert Theater, which was an incredible um, performance where he brought all these different companies back from all over the world. Now they were playing everywhere, and uh, it was a quite a, a celebration, and all of Broadway celebrated with with us and it was a celebration for everybody for the audiences for it was us saying thank you to them and and they were saying thank you to us and and all these companies from all over the world uh, participated and there's actually a uh, footage that they show at the Goodspeed Opera House. They have the, the file oh. archives on this of the final song when you have line after line after line of oh. this chorus line. It's incredible, incredible. And they had to build special, Robin Wagner had to uh, build special um, steel frame, you know, poles to support the stage because the stage was not going to be able to hold that weight, you know. So they had to reinforce this stage, right. and uh, they had to hang special lighting, and uh, it was just so well done. It was done well by by everybody, and, and that was... the whole blue theater that we dressed in was the dressing room, and everybody was on stage, and they had all the seamstresses, and and uh, you know it was kind of once in a lifetime experience, I think. Now, and that was only back in well, not only, but it was thirty years ago. It was nineteen eighty three. Right. Yeah. But that was also before, I think, AIDS hit. So, how many oh, people... It wasn't. It was, it was, it was around that time, uh, I think they're finding out that AIDS was a very much, um, very prominent in the early 80s, you oh. know, before. So, had you, but, they lost people by then already who were in the original cast? No. So at, at that point, everybody could be regrouped and, and, and brought back. But then over the next few years, um, you know, we lost some people, including Michael yes. Bennett. To, yes, right. To, were you, um, what was it like seeing him towards that end? I mean, did you visit him 
Was it tough to no, see this I person? No, I didn't know. He, he, never let, he never told anyone. He didn't want to share that. He felt um, for some reason that he, he, didn't, he wanted that to be private. And, and that's the, the terrible, you know, shame that, uh, that people couldn't be there for him to support him and, and not to, you know, so that he wouldn't feel so alone with this. And that was a problem with so many people. Um, even by the, even in 1987, when he passed, there was still yes, 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 and and you know, and then that was the year I I, I just lost everyone, um, mentors, and Bob Fosse died three months later, and um, you know I was I was in in Washington at the National Theater the night he died. He, we had just rehearsed the show, you know, for for hours. We were opening at the National Theater, and uh, Gwen was with us, and. And uh, after the show, Joe Harris and Cy Coleman came back and said, you know, sit down, we have some news. And I went, oh, my first thought was, oh, no, we got our pink slip, the show's not going to run here. And um, it, it was quite the opposite. And, and, and uh, when they said Bob died, I, I didn't know who they were talking about because I could not imagine after, you know, being with him all day and he was so... He worked so hard with all of us and, you know, incredible. As if he had so much to right. give us as a director, and he just kept hour after hour, you know. But, I'm sorry, oh, the yeah. name, was this? Larry the... Kurt and Larry, Larry Kurt. I mean, the, the list is too long to even say, but um, that was a very tragic uh, time. And, you know, we're, we're still dealing with it, aren't we? Well, uh, absolutely. Um, and we are talking, I'm, I'm sorry to have gotten on such a downer, but we also have some up and happy questions for the wonderful Donna McKechnie, the Tony, Tony winner of A Chorus Line. And we can even go back a little bit to um, the, the high times of A Chorus Line. And even at the public theater, when it became a cause celeb, and you have all these celebrities sitting like two oh feet away goodness. from the stage. Yes, yes. Such as, do, do you remember meeting anybody, not, not just seeing them there, but having funny or anecdotal interactions with the likes of oh, Groucho? Or Marx, Groucho Marx was in our green room so many nights, and he brought us a big cake with a, with a foot in it and an axe, you know, like break a leg. <laughs> it was very funny. And, uh, oh my gosh, Ruth Gordon saw the show, I think, ten times with the Garth and Kane in and and Diana Ross would be sitting on the steps because she couldn't get a seat, and and Dick Cavett was sitting right next to her, and you know all these incredible, you know people. Every and when I say everybody saw it, I really mean that everybody saw it. <laughs> and this was it's first like, still off Broadway. This was before it became the longest well, yeah. at the time the longest because running. Yes. In fact, uh, there were there were people coming to the you know the, at the public theater downtown. They have other um, theaters, you know, small theaters. And when a couple of the shows were sold out and the box office would say, well, we have this show that's just starting previews. Uh, it's called A Chorus Line. And people would go, oh, we don't know what that is. Do we have to see that tonight? And, <laughs> and they would go, and it was never um, publicized. No one knew anything about it. So when people sat down in that small theater and they heard that piano going da-da-da-da-da-da, they, when the lights came up and the orchestra came in, I, I, they were just blown away. So without even spending a, a, a nickel on publicity, once it opened, there were, there were lines around the, the whole block of Lafayette Street. And it was kind of sensational. I mean, that, that doesn't happen that often, I don't think. Well, um, I think, of so course... It, the, the word of mouth, it was purely word of mouth. And also anybody who has ever either been an actor or wanted to be a performer of any sort or ever had to give a speech will, uh, will appreciate, will understand, and will connect to a chorus line in ways it's that other every, shows... Yes, it's for, but it's for everybody. It's a great metaphor for so many people. There's something for everyone in that show, it seems like, because even now, all these, like you say, 30, 40 years later, people are always coming up to me with lines from the show, like little lines, and and making references to it that when it's appropriate, and there's so many are appropriate in your day to day living because it's all about the angst of adolescence and the self discovery, and and there's so many great 
lines in it. Oh, please. Well. My whole life I've been dance three looks one. So that's my, uh, my, <laughs> my tragedy. I am, by the way, Rabbi Sal Solomon, and I'm chatting with the delightful Donna McKechnie. And we're talking not just about a chorus line, although, of course, we have to bring that up again and again. Because also, did you see the, um, the revival, the Broadway revival they did a couple of years ago? And what did you think of it? Uh, in 2007, yeah. I went with uh, my mates, you know, the, some of the original people. And uh, I was thrilled to see Michaels. By York Lee did a great job. Um, you know, restaging it and, and uh, with Bob Avian directing and and to see Michael's work again at the Schubert Theater on that stage was 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 wonderful, really, really wonderful. It's hard. I have a lot of subjective feelings because whenever I see this show everywhere, I've seen it a lot. I've done it in you know in four different countries. Um, I still see the original people. It's the, mm. it's like the ghost of their their performances. Um, have stayed with me. There's so much in my solar plexus that I. It's hard for me to see anyone else. I. I, I don't know. I can't. It's hard. I, I. I can see other people and I can be drawn into it, but there's always that echo of the um, the original person that I felt like brother or sister. You know, um, I mean, I've, I've seen the, the chorus line well into the run of the original, and then the, I also saw the uh, the revival, but I still, in my mind sometimes, I see the original TV commercial of just that line of them with the, with the photographs in front of their faces, and the, yeah, the photos coming down. Oh, God, I need this show. I mean, that stays <laughs> with me from all these years, too. Amazing. Did yeah. you? Was it? I'm uh, still singing that song. Well, oh, you mean in your See, cabaret? Every, every new show I do, I'm going, I really need this show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but one thing that you might have really, really wanted but did not get, and this happens so often in musicals when they're being turned into movies, you, yeah. they made the movie of a chorus line, Richard Attenborough did, and flopped. Did you take some happiness okay, from so that? Okay, so this is a positive uh, spin I have on the movie. Okay. Um, because they don't like to say anything negative, but I, I'm very subjective about it. You know, I'm very, you know, uh, but the positive thing is that that movie didn't do so well here, okay? But it did great in Europe, and it paved the way for me to be invited over to this great theater in Paris, the Chateau Theater, and I performed uh, the show in Paris because they weren't, it took 13 years for them to even acknowledge Chorus Line as, as a show that they wanted to produce. So huh. the, mo the movie cinched it, and I'm so grateful to that movie. <laughs> so you never know the, the silver lining of the... Uh. Yes, it was there for me. So I'm very grateful because it was one of the high highlights of my Chorus Line experience, you know, to... To, to do it in Paris, here. yes. Can, can I ask, did you even do a screen test or audition for the movie, or not even that close? I don't, no, I, 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 I met him, but, it, you know, when a director, you probably know this, when uh, it, the movies are a director's medium, and they really want most, most times, especially with musicals, to discover their own stars, you know? They, they, they want to have their own stamp on it, and I think the casting of of, of that was, had a lot to do with that, and and also the, you know, I think I think that's what I think. Okay, no, that's um, a very very reasonable. Now let's move on to some other shows because you have done other things in your life besides a chorus line and besides, of course, the cabaret show that you are bringing to Birdland on Monday night at 7 o'clock called In Good Company with, on that particular night, your special guest, Jerry Mitchell, and then you'll have other guests as the, the mumps or bi-monthly show yes, goes Nick on. Nick Adams and Nikki McCallum. I have to say their names. Uh, oh, of course. They're Sorry. brilliant. They're brilliant singers. And, and Nick Adams was one of the stars of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, if you've seen that show. The, yes, um, the Broadway show, yes. He's a, he was great in that show, and he's, uh, you know, honored me with the, with the, the appearing here as Nikki McCallum, who was a, when I went up to do the O'Neill uh, conference this summer, and I mentored some young, brilliant singers, and uh, she was one of them. So I, I'm thrilled, I'm so excited to... Um, oh, yes. 
be what? there with them. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean to leave. Now, feel free to include their names every time we mention the, the cabaret show. But I'm talking now also some other uh, theatrical productions that you have appeared in, including touring okay. in Call Me Madam with La Merm. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. Well, it, it, I, tell us some Merman stories. I, I got, yes, I, I love Ethel Merman so much. Um, she, you know, I do one of her songs in, in, in my show that I'm doing Monday night. Uh, the hostess with the mostest. It's kind of literal, but there you go. I I loved her because she was. Um, we were doing this the circuit uh, Midwestern theater, the Kenley Circuit, and I was with. Uh, you know, I, I stood in the wings and watched her every night. She was in, incredible. Um, maybe people don't always like that kind of performing because she did the same thing. You know, every eye look, every finger was placed a certain way, and every delivery, but. It was solid, and um, people would be standing at the end of the show, every every show. Um, she was just a very autonomy personified, that's what I call her. Ha. Uh, was she okay to you? Was she uh, reasonably pleasant, cordial, nice, friendly? Uh, she, well, you know, no one told me that her daughter, Ethel Jr., had... Uh, Ethel Jr.? <laughs> Yes. Ethel yes. Jr. had died three months earlier, oh, oh. and the last person to do the role that I was doing of the princess was her daughter. And no one told me that until I found out afterwards. So I understood she wasn't very um, friendly. She would go right from the stage to her dressing room, and the dressing room right to the stage. And um, that and that was pretty much her way of grieving, I think, because she never toured. Mary mm. Martin toured all the time, but Ethel never toured. And I think that she had a hard time. I, I, this is, might be my imagination, but I, I, I know that was a period of grief for her. And when I look back now, it makes all perfect sense. But I know afterwards I realized that she had some affection for me because when, uh, when I was leaving the show, she, she started making these sounds. This woman who did the same performance every single, you know, the same way, she crossed her eyes at me and started making these clucking sounds in her throat. And I thought, oh, my God, she's having a stroke. <laughs> and I went off stage and I told the stage manager, something's wrong with Miss Merman. And he said, no, no, she's just tr saluting you. She's giving you that vaudevillian, you know, she's trying to break you up. So that last oh, performance, they, that's the old... Uh, tr it was yes, like yes, it's vaudeville. You, you try to, you go against all of your professional ethics and you... And you turn up stage and you make a face or you black out a tooth. And um, and I remember, you know, one of my first summer stock shows, they used to do that. And I thought it was ridiculous, but I didn't know. What did I know? Um, but that was a great, I didn't know it was, first of all, a great, um, you know, affection and compliment, you know. It's kind of like saying to someone, well, good luck and, and thanks, thanks for being here, but now you're off to other shows and it was it was a salute that was not i mean to you, know, you earn the respect of one of the luminaries which is a, a thing you know I mean, yeah, yeah. And now speaking of luminaries you were also in a 1971 revival of the musical on the town with oh, Phil, yeah. phyllis newman the wonderful woman she was on this radio program as well as oh, yeah. a young right. bernadette peters Bernadette Peters and, and uh, Rob Field directing and choreographing a wonderful choreographer and um, yeah it was great I that's when I really got to know Phyllis too and and uh, we just had a great time it, it was unfortunate the show I, I thought it was a good production but um, it, it, it had a hard I think three months or something but that was it's always so sad when you know a show that's the first time ever and since I've never experienced it where we were in we were taking a vote as a company in the basement of the Imperial Theater and um, even the musicians and the stagehands were with us which is unheard of and we all said that we would take a cut in pay to keep the show running through that very difficult month of February and um, and everybody was on board, and, and it still, there still wasn't enough. Wasn't um, that, uh, but I, I was so moved by that um, that meeting, of, of, because that, that's unheard of, you know? Well, I mean, um, other 
there have been people who volunteered, but that across the board thing is pretty pretty amazing yeah, and wonderful. That's unusual, yeah. No, but that's yeah. The, that's the family of our our business too. That's the beauty part of it. You know that people really um, uh, it's a collaboration. Any show, there might be stars' names over the title, but it's a truly a collaboration of everybody has their job to do and everybody respects the work that everyone does. Now, also, speaking of people that Donna McKechnie has worked with, one of my idols, one of my all-time favorite legends, you did a funny thing happen on the way to the forum tour with, oh, oh my heart is, is fluttering just <laughs> mentioning this name, Arnold Stang! Oh, my God, I thought you were going to say Jerry Lester. Yeah, Jerry Lester, Arnold. but Arnold Stang! Tell me about Arnold! Oh, he was great. He was he was exactly like that. He was a great person. He was adorable. Um, he was a lot smarter than the character would you know when we do it, when he would go into his characterizations. But um, he was a very I, I really liked him. Oh, he was good. Fun. Oh, good. Oh, good. I, I only want to hear great nice clown. things. No, he's a great clown. You know, um, I, I really we had fun. And Ed, Edward Everett Horton, you know, from the oh, movies, I, yes. he was quite a gentleman. He he was so nice. He took each person in that company out individually to dinner. Huh. And so that, so that he had an, an evening at a very nice restaurant with each individual in that, uh, no matter how lonely their part was. Uh, I thought that was quite a, a, a wonderful thing for him. That's a very menschlich type thing to do, a, a, a Jewish word, but it means a very menschy sort of... Yes, thing. menschy. He was a mensch. mensch. And another mensch. He was Jewish, but he was, he, he was a mensch. Well, here's, here's a Jewish mensch that you worked with on a show that did not apparently ever happen. I wonder about the, a, a show called Showtune, which you worked with Jerry Herman on. What happened? Oh, yes. That? Well, we did... We, we did a show. We did that. That pr was produced out in Nyack, I think. But I don't think it had. Um, I don't. I don't think it was going to be moved. I oh, it wasn't meant for Broadway anyway. Oh, okay, okay. No, no. I think it was just. We, it was a. It was a lovely review, and he very, very much was hands on. And of course, yes, I, I adore him. He's a very special person and a great composer, and a, a great great person, a big heart, and uh, he was very much uh, there and, um, and, and was very hopeful. Good. And uh, it's a very hard, you know, that's a very hard thing to do a re review of someone's music and make it, you know, kind of, because it's all theater music, but um, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed that music. Well, who doesn't enjoy Jerry Herman music? I mean, my goodness. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, a couple of other shows, and since we're also speaking of uh, Jewish people, you've also got um, Annie Warbucks, the Martin Charnin sequel. Oh, yes. Yeah. I love that show. You know, wow. we, that, that was a great show. That was a great show. Uh, people would say, you know, we always try to figure out, well, what was wrong? Was, was the, I thought it was the wrong venue for it. Uh, because Hark Presnell was such a big, had such stature, and it was a tiny theater, but maybe it wasn't tiny, but it seemed, uh, it, it was a, I think it was a great show. It had a great integrity to it, and fabulous, Peter Gennaro did some wonderful dances, and great cast of people, uh, just, uh, just uh, tremendous. I thought it was love, love, and for the family too. It was a great family show. It was just, it was as you say. Maybe they shouldn't, if not on Broadway. Maybe it just was in the wrong off Broadway house. Because I, I remember. Oh, it, you know yeah. what? I I talked to Charles Strauss recently. I saw him, and I think it's coming back. Oh. I I don't think I'm, you know, spilling the beans, but I, I think that there's something in the air about it coming back, uh, and which it should do. Because it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Great music, great score. And speaking of really, really good scores and good music, you also were in Promises. Promises, the Bacharach oh. David and Neil Simon musical. Any memories from there? Yeah, you have what? What? Oh, yeah, Promises. My goodness, yeah. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Do you have I'm, any... I'm bombarded. Every Thanksgiving, I'm bombarded on YouTube with uh, that number that they lift from the, the Tony Awards. Michael Bennett's uh, choreography to Turkey Lurkey Time. Of course, of course. I mean, do you remember any, well, again, either rehearsing the show or any fun uh, stories from the show or the people that you worked with? 
Um, well, uh, well, yeah. The, 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 you know, those are the days when you would go out of town because the out of town audiences would would really help. Um, you know, give give people information by what they liked, what they didn't like, and the first time out on that that number, I've told this story before, but um, it was not a hit. Michael was trying something new and different, he thought, and trying to be more realistic. And so he said, "I'm going to choreograph it for as if you're three secretaries who um, made this up in your living room and you made your costumes and." That's kind of what it looked like the first time out, and it was pretty bad. So, 24 hours later, he and Bob Avian threw this dance number together, literally out of town in, in their hotel room, you know, choreographing all night. And the next night it was in, and it stopped the show uh, ever since. And did you, uh, since we asked this question before about the chorus line, did you see the Promises, Promises revival that was done just about two or three years ago on Broadway? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I miss Michael. I always miss Michael's uh, work. I, I, I can't help it. You know, I'm prejudiced, perhaps. But um, I, I really, there are so many things I, I liked about it. I, I love the back rack score. I mean, um, Hal David's lyrics are gorgeous, you know? Well, yeah. Um, and I mean, it's a good shot. I really like that revival. I, unfortunately, I was not around um, to go see the original, but I would have loved seeing Donna McKechnie in the original. I certainly would have. And I wish I'd seen you for sure in the musical that they did of the education of Hyman Kaplan. Oh, yeah, I love that, too. I just talked to Barbara Minka. She's, you know, out in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, it's great when you do these shows that they're... You know, you, you, you become like a family and you're able to, you know, have these friendships last, last a lifetime. And that was a very, a, a, another, uh, very warm family show about the immigration of, um, you know, in the, um, of this young, this man who was trying to become a citizen and, um, you know, the, the Jewish immigration, at, at, uh, uh, Mm -hmm. I, what year was that? I'm trying to. Oh, I, I don't recall. When, yes, but, but it was a, a very touching, warm show, and and uh, and the music was great, and and the opening night, um, Martin Luther King was shot. That was the night that tragedy happened, and um, you that know, was... Mayor Lindsay was in the audience, and he got up and left with his whole entourage, and uh, we were. We knew something was going on. I, I don't think the show stopped, but because um, no one really knew until after the show was over. But that, the kind of um, the politics of the show, just were kind of um, I don't know. It, 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 I thought it was just important news. You know what I mean? So rude of Martin think... Luther King to get shot on on the opening night. I mean, it, he could have waited. He could have given a Memphis speech a day or two later. He had your opening, he had the reviews. I don't know. Oh, Very rude. Oh, that's, what, that's the point of view I was trying to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was... It, it was it, 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 everybody, I don't know, you're probably too young to remember, but I remember it was a very, very... It was... Uh, they talk about the loss of innocence, you know, when these tragedies happen, but it was. It was... Everybody was so sad and somber about it. And, um, and I think afraid so that, also. I mean, I, you probably would have been afraid of riots as well, you know? Well, well, no, it, everybody was too sad. I mean, the, the anger perhaps came. I, I don't remember. I, I remember the, the outrage, but it was, it was just a, a, you know, it, it was just beating everybody down. It, it was so awful. Um, so, yeah, and we're still, you know, dealing with that, too. Um, so hopefully we, we evolve and, and learn along the way, you know? Hopefully. To, I, I, I'm still waiting to evolve. I'm, I'm waiting for it you? to happen to me. <laughs> well, keep seeing theater because that, that helps you. Theater is great for that. It, it helps people along those difficult uh, soul-searching moments. Now, one show that I totally forgot to ask, and it's one of the great scores of all time in musical theater, and you were in the original, you know, everybody thinks Donna McKechnie, Chorus Line, Chorus Line, Chorus Line, chorus. you were in the original company. My yes. God. So, what a score that is. That's a, I'm, yeah, I, I've been in great, great shows with great people. 
and written by fantastic. I mean, Stephen Sondheim is, is, you know, that's a, a privilege to even know him and, and to be able to work with him on, on three projects. My first singing audition was for Stephen Sondheim for A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Wow. And, and then to do, be able to do Follies with him in the rehearsal room, reworking a show that he had already written 20 years earlier was another life-enhancing experience. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and Company is, is the score of that show. Hal Prince and, and Stephen Sondheim, you know, created that piece with George First, And um, those people are, you know, still my closest friends from that show. And um, Wait, is, is George so I, still I never tire of that score. I mean, I don't always, I don't listen to the shows I've done that much. You know, it's like it's in my past. I've done, I'm always trying to find something new. Um, but that is a, a score I, I never tire of. Of course. And then do you have any remembrances, though, of either... I don't know, uh, from the audition, or not the audition, from the rehearsal process of lines being changed, of, of words that Sondheim wanted to switch, of, of anything from the company, because all most of us know from that original company is seeing the Penny Baker documentary and watching, you know, Elaine Stritch come back the next day, right. and Dean Jones, yes. you know, rock it out. Yeah. And, but but well, any, there, was, there was a lot of the, um, you know, my dance was cut out of town and bought, was devastating to me. They cut um, Pam Myers singing uh, Another Hundred People, um, which was a, 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 it was always a great song, and she always did a great job, but it, but how, of course, everyone understood in theory that it's about the whole, it's not about the individual or the individual number, it's about the whole piece, and he was trying to make it work, and there were some scary days out of town when, you know, if you didn't have your number in the show, you would be that that was the first sign of that you would mm. no longer be needed, you know. So I was desperately, you know, hoping that this, they could work this out and uh, and Pam, you know. But Hal Prince is such a gentleman, you know. He made sure that he took us individually in the back of the theater in the lobby, and before he made these announcements to the company, he he said he told us individually that, that what he had to do, he had to take it out, but it was just to see if it needed to be in another spot and. He had to, you know, and, and uh, then we went in with him, and he told the company, but I thought that is a very fine person, you know, to do that, because as you probably know, that doesn't always happen. You you kind of, you can hear terrible news in a very terrible way a lot, and um, he well, made it a lot easier. Well, as I, as I mentioned at the, the beginning of the interview, uh, when I was talking with the wonderful Carol Lawrence, and she said that when uh, Jerome Robbins had notes, he just shouted them. You know, he could give you 50 notes in front of everybody. Right. <laughs> it was, right. you know, no punches pulled. That was it, you know. Oh, and speaking of someone she also mentioned, she was also talking briefly about David Merrick, who was involved in uh, the show that you were also in, one of your last... Uh, Broadway appearances was oh, in State Fair. State Fair, yes, which again a show that like sort of like Annie Warbucks probably deserved better than it got. Do you think? Yeah, we had it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that that show, and, and I'm working now with Andrea McCardle on a a new production called Four Girls Four, um, and it's it's we're going to start in, in March. Anyway, we we both go back to that that time um, with. You know, it was just a great company, a show we were very successful on the road for seven months. You know, we toured together before we came to the Music Box Theater. And um, I don't think it was, per people didn't quite know how to perceive it when they heard about it. After they saw it, they liked it because it was such a great, um, you know, it was Rodgers and Hammerstein and, uh, and all this great music and, and music that was put in from other shows and uh, uh, it was an original piece, in other words, and um, I, I think as that we again there was like a few months in New York. But David Merrick at the very end, you know, was was very, uh, you know, had kind of retired because he had a stroke and he wasn't producing anymore. But he he saw this show in Philadelphia, and he couldn't speak 
at that point in time. But as soon as he got back in, involved in producing again, I saw, and I, I wasn't the only one, I mean, people, we, we saw that he started communicating, he st was able to start saying words. It was kind of phenomenal that I thought, my goodness, his life's blood, you know, that, that charge that he would get from, you know, the passion from producing. He was such a smart producer. He's, he's rising to this, uh, this place and, and he's doing it and it's, it's bringing him back, you know. Um, so that was kind of an incredible thing. And we did the recording at least, so we have that. But the show, yeah, that, that deserved a longer run, I think. And also, well, I mean, you probably took something from seeing Merrick like that because you yourself went through a whole big thing of being diagnosed, that you will certainly never dance again, never right. perhaps oh, yeah. rock properly again because you had terrible arthritis going back yeah. almost 40 years now. And yet, tell the story, and, and, and this is a wonderful way to kind of wrap things up because it has a Jewish theme to it of 18. So tell, tell, tell. Oh, my goodness, yes, you read my book, I can tell, because that's the story that, that I wrote the book because of this. This is why I wrote the book, to tell people that I was, when I was um, diagnosed with this crippling um, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the doctors would say, and, and I went to many, and they would say, you have to take 18 buffering, you have to go on drugs, you have to take gold injections. Don't forget, this was a long time ago, and they didn't have a lot of, things yet, to, you know, other alternative things that work just as well or better, but um, I just knew, I, I just knew that instinctively something told me I saw a big no in my, in, right in my forehead and the inside, and I went, I have to find a way out of this, and I found this great, through a friend, um, Dr. Sam Gentland, who, when I met him, he's from Trenton, New Jersey. He was 95 when I met him. Oh, my God. And he was this sweet person. With his hands were as soft as silk. And when I met him, a very slight person. And he said, I've, uh, I'm, I'm tired of burying my patients. So I decided to use my medical knowledge. And he had vitamin therapy and, and, and use alternative methods with food and diet and um lifestyle change and um and he gave me i had to write uh a yes and no list it was difficult for me to even hold the pen oh my god um and i he gave me a list of the of a yes and no list for food and behavior and um and he then he, it, it was basically the elimination diet and then he charged me 18 dollars dollars which as you know is the the sign the Hebrew sign for life, and the, he said, I just want you to, when you recover, I want you to um, write me a letter and tell me. Because he showed me all of these letters of people who had MS, cancer, arthritis, who wrote him and thanked him because he told me, in, if you do this, and also I had to verbalize very positive things. I had to verbalize a feeling if it was a good feeling or if it was a good thought. And um, I just did it, you know, and I didn't understand it at the time, but I do now. And he said, in three weeks, the pain will subside. In six weeks, you'll be able to walk standing up. And in six months, you can start exercising. And I said, um, and I'm a dancer, doctor, will I be able to dance again? And he said, in about a year. And... Um, and that's that was kind of tough. true, was it? And you were dancing, I mean, not just that's dancing true. in your it living room. true, but... and I had, I had to... I mean, that is something that was so much bigger than me, the story of that, that I thought, because I, I had no desire to write a book about my personal life. I don't think it's anyone's business, really, but I thought this is important because if people, even if they don't do exactly what I did, at least if they know that there are other ways, uh, you don't have to let anyone tell you your destiny, you know, even if they mean well. You have to really um, find educate yourself and, and find alternative ways of, of dealing with problems and there's always hope, you know, and, and you can you can come through these things and um, and you don't have to live a, a painful life. You can live a pain-free life. 
Now, after that year, when you were essentially pretty much healed, cured, do you still today have to do these affirmation things, oh, the vitamins? Oh, oh, I do the, I mean, that's become part of my, my whole thinking. And I had to change the way, I, I tend to take all the criticism, um, all the toxic attitudes out of my, my life. I didn't even know I had them. Huh. But, um, uh, yeah, and when I teach acting now, from time to time, I will... I'll, I'll give my students an exercise. I, I say, just walk around the street. Be aware of how you talk to yourself. You know, but sometimes we're not aware of what goes on in our brain. And just be aware of, of, of if you have a negative feeling and, and you start, you know, calling yourself. If you do something and you say, oh, that was stupid. Um, or how could you? If you start criticizing yourself, catch yourself as soon as you can and turn it into a positive and have much more compassion. And uh, that's exactly what I had to learn. I had to learn compassion, and once I felt that, that's when I started to mend, and that's when I started to get healthy. So I had to change my life completely in my thoughts. Wow, and you are, God willing, healthy now in most ways. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh. I still go to ballet class. I just, I'm 71, I just turned 71. Mazel I'm still dancing, I'm, I'm still, I have a new voice teacher. He's actually 93. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if he's still alive and talking, he has he's something great. to teach. He's great. He has a great baritone voice. So we, we don't, you know, we don't have to like, you know, crumble up at a certain age. We can, if we keep active and, and healthy and, and being creative with our energy, we can keep our spirit young and our bodies young too. Are you auditioning for uh, Broadway things that come up off Broadway? Uh, you oh know? yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm working all the time. I'm doing symphony work. I do a lot of concerts. Um, and I'm starting with this new company of, of, of it's called Four Girls Four. It's me, Andrea McArdle, Maureen McGovern, and Faith Prince. Oh my goodness. And, what a, what a and team. It's a great group. We're all redheads, so it's going to be fun. I mean, is it a cabaret? What, what is it exactly that you're putting together with it? It's a it's a show for all of us. Where we 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 open together and we do our individual twenty minutes and then we close together and it's a it's four of us on on tour. And are you doing that already, or are you still in the planning uh, rehearsal? We're just starting. We're starting uh, in March. We have everything else. We have a, the whole show is already. I I have the stage and opening number for us. Um, on the, the the 10th, we go into our first rehearsal for that, and we're, we're off and running. We have booking starting in March. Oh, man, mazel. This is so exciting. And, and, of course, if people want to see Donna McKechnie before March, all you have to do is go <laughs> on you. Monday evening. Notice how I led so so easily into that segue. This Monday at 7 o'clock at Birdland at 315 West 44th Street, Donna McKechnie in good company, also with her special guest Jerry Mitchell, the choreographer, and who else is on the stage with you? We have Nick Adams, Nick Adams, and Nikki McCallum. Nick Adams and Nikki McCallum. Sorry for not uh, remembering them that's myself, okay. but that's, that's Rabbi, great. Rabbi, thank you so much. This was a wonderful hour to spend with you. Absolutely a joy. And by the way, the name of um, your book, Donna McKechnie's book, is Time Steps, if you want to get a copy of that. And you have a CD coming out in January called Same Place, Another Time. So you are keeping so busy, and it has been such a delight to have you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Lots of love.